So first of all, what is this thing? Well, I'm pretty sure this isn't the first video that you've watched on this, so we'll keep it brief. To explain it simply, it's an enhanced version of Pokemon Yellow that has countless quality of life changes, updated team rosters, and overall a more challenging experience. Oh, and um, when I say challenging, I mean not even close. And definitely not Sweet Mother of God! The game was created by an extremely talented group of people, led by the one and only Smith Plays Pokemon. And as someone who played Pokemon Yellow on release at the age of five, I'm here to judge how they did. Before you even start the game, you notice two great changes. You can now be a female character, and you can choose the newly added hard mode. This basically takes the hardcore rule set from a hardcore Nuzlocke and builds it into the game. Anyway, we were gifted Dango the Pikachu and blitzed through the start of the game, which was pretty identical to the normal yellow version. We caught Wendell the Pidgey on Route 2, Lint the Mankey on Route 22, we beat Smith, our rival, and then we caught Big DB the Weedle in Viridian Forest, who immediately evolved into a Beedrill. So onto the first gym leader of the run and we lead Blint against Brock's Geodude and we use Leer to lower its defense. Rock Throw does minimal damage as Blint hits hard with a low kick, flinching the rock, opening it up for a scratch for the KO. Onyx came out and constricted Blint with a bind and then again with a constrict. Blint manages to land another Leer as it's grappled a third time. The Onyx for some reason then tries a different strategy and uses Bide which is a massive mistake because this fatal error leaves it wide open as Blint delivers not one, not two, but three low kicks for the victory. Not even close. After Brock we continued east catching Snoopy the Oddish on Route 3, Ringo the Sandshrew in Mount Moon and Yaxley the Ekans on Route 4. Upon arriving at Cerulean we met the girl who offers you a Bulbasaur if you have a Pokemon that's happy enough which we do not. But don't worry though, because I know some emotional manipulation that can help us out. It's common knowledge that if you use an item on a Pokemon, it gets happier, but in Generation 1, there's nothing saying that that item needs to actually take an effect. So long story short, we got Dango, we got an Antidote, and we tried to use the Antidote on Dango many, 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 many times. We did it so much that the Pikachu fell in love with us and the lady was like, yo cool, here's a cabbage. We called it Lindor, but we did put it in the box for now since we already have Snoopy, but it's good to have options in case of catastrophic Pokemon failure, I guess. The Nugget Bridge fight against Smith actually went really well. Spearow fell, Rattata fell, Bellsprout was gusted away, and then Eevee was impaled several times by a bee the size of a small child. Standard operation, really. We were then gifted Clunko the Charmander on Route 24 and caught Chunder the Abra on Route 25. We made it to Bill's house and then this weird crab thing turned into a man and offered us a cruise ticket. Now if there's one thing my parents taught me, it was to never take candy off of strangers, but they said nothing about crabs and cruise tickets, so I guess it's fine? Before we get to the cruise though, we need to take on Misty. We lead with Dango, who gets good damage off against the Psyduck, takes a bit of damage, but then one more electric attack gets the KO. Goldeen suffers a similar fate, hitting a critical waterfall attack in the process. We switch out to our newly evolved Snoopy, who drains the fish's health and renders it dead. Misty sends out her ace Pokemon, Starmie, who launches a Swift as we launch a Leech Seed. We switch into Big with the intent on using Pin Missile, but we took way too much damage from my liking, so we switch into Wendell. We take a couple of attacks very well, hitting the star with a wing attack. We pivot one more time into Blint, who then gets the KO. It wasn't too difficult to spot the huge cruise ship when we arrived at Vermilion, so we hurried on board only to be met with Smith again. Dango tested out its newly learnt Thunder Punch and Raticate, dealing a decent amount of damage, but taking a Hyper Fang in the process. Both Pokemon zipped around using Quick Attack, clashing time and time again, but Smith's Raticate was the first to fall. Weeping Bell came out, so we switched into Wendell, who was hit straight away with a Stun Spore. A few rounds of bad luck go by as Weeping Bell continues to spam growth until Wendell manages to land a Wing Attack and a Quick Attack for the KO. Wendell managed to get a couple more hits in before we switched out to Snoopy. The baby pangolin tried its best to sink its claws into Snoopy, but the type advantage won us the matchup. Eevee hit us with a headbutt and before we can get our bearings we're hit again by a quick attack. We used stun spore and then we hit it with an acid but the damage was getting too much and we have to switch. Blint took a volley of attacks but it held its focus and delivered a powerful critical hit karate chop to knock out the Eevee winning the match. We then met the captain of the entire ship who was apparently seasick. Look I know it's not my place to judge but are you in the right line of work? Now that we had cut, it was time for the third gym leader. Surge has one Pokemon in the form of a Raichu, but that Raichu is five levels above the level cap, so to get for it deathless, you're gonna have to put some thought into it. But then, you can just bring a ground type, like the Glit from the cave. Well distant viewer, you're underestimating Smith. You see, he knows that Diglett Cave, even on a Nuzlocke, is a guaranteed way of getting a ground type. So because of this, he's given Raichu access to Surf. 
So you better hope that your Diglett or your Dogtrio, who is at minimum 5 levels under the Raichu, can both outspeed and one-shot this thing. Anyway, the battle begins and Snoopy takes a hefty body slam, but does manage to land a Leech Seed in return. A second body slam releases the paralytic spores that hinder Raichu, so Snoopy's job here was done and we switch into Dango, who took a big surf. The recovery of a Leech Seed allowed Dango to get a bit reckless. Both mice slam into each other with Dango expectedly coming off worse, but there's one thing that Dango has that Raichu lacks, and that is the ability to switch. Dango switches into Klungo who takes a Thunderbolt, Klungo switches into Blint who takes the next hit, Chunder sees off a Thunderbolt well and then pivots into Wendell. All the while, Leech Seed is sapping the rat's health bit by bit. Since Wendell had free reign, it was just one more quick attack and the rat went down, winning us the battle. On our way out of the gym, Officer Jenny said that we can have a Squirtle for free as long as you guys like the video, so I've taken the Squirtle, so if you guys could do your bit, that'd be great. She also informed us that the path to the east is blocked by a large unmoving Snorlax, so if you wanted to make it to the next gym, we're going to have to go for a cave to the east of Cerulean. The cave was dark and full of terrors, but luckily Chanda can light up his spoon so we can see where we're going. Oh yeah, Chanda has a spoon now. I don't know where he got it but he seems very attached to it so I don't really want to take it off of him. But anyway, thanks to Chunder's new party trick we got through the cave no problem. We ran right through Lavender Town because we needed to make it to the shopping capital of Kanto, Celadon City. We explored the city and just found this Eevee just chilling there unattended. Unattended? Unattended? And of course I can't stop off at the Celadon shopping mall and not pick up some evolutionary stones. After stopping off at the Pokemon Center I heard a rumor that someone was going around stealing Pokemon. It was unattended. Oh, you're on about Team Rocket at the casino. Yeah, that makes sense. So myself, presumably a 10 year old child, decided, you know what, this is a job for me. Not that literal policewoman I met about 10 minutes ago, me. See, that was easy. Oh, and Snoopy is this thing now. And Tobin's got ears. The boss of Team Rocket said something about a scope and a tower of dead Pokemon. So we took the scope to that one tower of dead Pokemon that we saw about five minutes ago. Conveniently, our rival Smith was there not mourning his alive rat because that's just a theory. A game theory! He leads with Firo who deals out a big hit to Tobin. We tag out to Dango as Firo gets an attack boost, but Dango is way too quick and we do get the KO with the Thunderbolt. Shelda comes out and- oh, never mind. Growlithe comes out and does take a Thunderbolt, but a second one is enough to get the KO. Kadabra and Dango cross beams, but Dango's looking worse for wear, so we do switch into Wendell who takes an attack, but it outspeeds and gets the KO. Smith then sends out his new evolution, Jolteon. This isn't going to be good for Wendell's well-being, so we switch out to Klongo who takes the brunt of the attacks, swiftly moving out of the way of a second bolt of lightning by burrowing under the floor of this multi-story building, delivering a big hit on the way up. Snoopy tags in, saving Klongo, and then releases a new type of score that puts the dog to sleep. Using its necrotic roots, it then saps the life force out of Jolteon, rendering it lifeless. Good thing we're in a cemetery. We then made it to the top of the tower where an ancient evil stirs, disturbed by the unwelcome presence within its domain. We brandished a soft, cuddly toy and gave it to the ghost, and then it just left us alone. Like, for real. Some wieners then wanted to fight, but we squashed them nice and easy, and then some old bloke gave us a flute saying it could awaken slumbering Pokemon. We then awaken a slumbering Pokemon, then put the slumbering Pokemon back to sleep, and then catch it in a ball. It was at this moment that I had to make a difficult choice. Dango was our first Pokemon of the run. When I tried to overdose it on antidotes, we connected. Our bond strengthened over the course of our adventure, and we're inseparable. I bet your heart skips a beat When you see something that reminds you of me But in my defense, Jolteon is really cool. Welcome to the team, Opal. We continued on our merry way and made it to Fuchsia City. We were told about some rare Pokemon in the Safari Zone, so how could I say no? We ran right there and caught Matcha the Tauros. I am very happy. I then didn't get lost and didn't have to look up a guide because I am very competent. We then got Surf and Strength, so we taught it to Tobin and Matcha respectively. Time to go back and fight Erika now, right? Tangler is hit by a hefty flamethrower as it constricts Klungo, but one more spew of flames does get the KO. Victory Bell comes out and falls to a flamethrower and a slash delivering a headbutt in the process. This time around Erika has an Ivysaur, but we do have a Charmeleon, so mm -hmm. Vile Plume comes out and misses a stun spore and then falls to a couple of attacks. This is why I don't really like monotype teams, but if you want to see some mocked up gym leaders, I think you might know a video that you could watch. 
With a positive mood, we left the gym and decided to pick up one more thing before leaving Saladin City. I overheard that a child on the mall has a TM for Ice Beam, which would be perfect for Tobin. With our newly evolved Charizard, we flew back to Fuchsia and took on Koga. Koga leads with Golbat, but Chunda's psychic attacks are way too much. Muck comes out and lives a psychic, badly poisoning our fabulous fox. One more attack, then takes it down. Tentacruel takes a psychic rather well, and then we switch into Opal after Chunda took a bit too much damage for comfort, avoiding a sludge and taking out the Jelly Boy. Thunderbolt does about half to Venomoth as Psychic does next to nothing. A critical hit then guarantees the knockout, winning us the badge. We ran over to Saffron City where we beat up a bunch of strong men and stole their Hitmonlee feet. Turns out this band of boobs didn't learn their lesson, so we gotta do it again. During the siege, Chunda did evolve into an Alakazam, and that is a massive power increase for the team. Apparently Smith didn't get the memo that there are literal criminals in the building and he wants to fight, like, now. Smith's Parasect was put to sleep and then Oko'd by a Sludge. Gyarados was taken out by a single Thunderbolt. Rhydon then walled Opal, but Tobin made the light work of it with Surf. Alakazam does huge damage with a Psychic, with Tobin just hanging on. Body Slam deals a lot of damage, but we do need to switch into Matcha. Psychic again deals big damage, but our Speedy Ball neutralizes the threat. I for some reason had a brain fart as Jolteon came out, so I switched into Klongo. I would not be taking questions on the matter, leave me alone. We then switched into Snoopy as we take two lots of pin missiles and I clenched very tightly at this moment. We then miss a sleep powder, that's good. Switching into Chunder, Jolteon digs underground. When it pops back up, we take it out with a couple of psychics and I was dumb in that fight, can't even deny it, but we did get the win. We unfortunately can't take the Lapras since we already got our Saffron City encounter, which was uh, a feat. So we just ran straight to Giovanni, who was rather easy, but he did have a Kingler this time around, so that's pretty fun. After liberating the second city from the Pokemon Yakuza at the ripe age of 10, it was time to take on the infamous Sabrina. Abra is an Abra and goes down to one strength. Hypno then goes down to a single double edge. Mr. Mime meets the same fate. Kadabra is a one shot from strength and Alakazam is one shot from double edge. Huh. Well then, moving on. After a lovely calm sail over to Cinnabar Island where we revived our own bill and called it, um, Mole, we ran through the Pokemon Mansion and then tackled the gym. Okay, Pokemon Quiz, I got this. Caterpie evolves into Butterfree. That is false. Metapod evolves into... What? Okay, next question. There are nine certified Pokemon League badges. Well, we've got the Boulder Badge, the Cascade Badge, there was the Rainbow Badge, the Crack Badge, the Sniper Scope Badge, the Upside Down Sea Badge, the Bell Badge, the Shield Badge, the Red Chick with no legs looking up to the Sky Badge, and the Grey Block Badge. So there's ten, not nine. There it. Okay, no more messing around, let's get on to Blaine. Rapidash comes out, who's one shot by an earthquake, and then he sends out Charizard. Nope. Uh, Ninetales comes out, and. Okay. Arcanine, surely you can take more than one hit. Yes, it took two hits to kill Arcanine. Magmar's then taken out by one hit. Okay, and that's that. Kind of done. There's no time to celebrate, though, because we need to take on Giovanni. We lead with Tobin, who took a critical earthquake, but then Oko's the turds with a surf. We switch out to Chunder, who safely eats a Thunderbolt, and then Oko's with a psychic and retaliation. Persian would be a threat if we didn't Oko it. Nido King then falls just like its wife did, and then Rhydon goes down to a single Mega Drain after hitting Snoopy with a rock slide, like nothing ever happened. Our next stop is the Pokemon League. We fought Smith again on Route 22 without any issues at all. We then made it through Victory Road and then proceeded onto the final gauntlet. Lorelei leads with Slowbro who goes down to a single Thunderbolt, Cloyster is taken out by a critical hit and then Dugong fails to break the trend. I knew that we couldn't Oko the Jinx so we opted for a Thunder Wave instead and Opal was put to sleep. We switch into Klungo forgetting that Fire doesn't resist Ice in Generation 1 but Jinx for some reason uses Bubble Beam, even with a crit it's not enough to take down our Dragon and then we unleash Flames getting the knockout. Lapras is the ace, so we switch into a sleepy opal who takes a blizzard very well. Unfortunately, we don't wake up in time, so we do need to switch out to Snoopy. We manage to avoid a sing, but then they also avoid a sleep powder. Blizzard does hit hard, but this time we land the sleep powder, and it's GG from there. For Bruno, we led Chunda, and it goes exactly how you think. Hitmonchan, Poliwrath, and Hitmonlee go down to one attack. We set up a reflect against Onyx and then take it down with two Psybeams to reserve Psychic PP. 
and then Machamp is dispatched by another one. Now you may think that Bruno is the easiest, but Agatha, we're gonna keep this one short. We O-code every single one of her Pokemon. Generation 1 Alakazam is just built different. On to Lance, Tobin actually manages to outspeed the Dragonite, getting the knockout with a single Ice Beam. Gyarados hits Opal with a Hyper Beam, but then falls to a Thunderbolt. Then Charizard follows in the same way. Now Aerodactyl can hit hard and quick, so we switch into Matcha, who eats a Rock Slide, and then leers the old bird before hitting a decent strength. Matcha then shows anime energy and narrowly avoids death, hitting back with a strength, getting the KO. The Ace Dragonite comes out, so we switch into the Resident Dragon Slayer, who takes a Hyper Beam and then ruins the Chunky Charizard's day with another Ice Beam. Onto the champion fight, we lead Matcha against Smith's Alakazam, and it was an easy matchup. Rhydon is hit with a big Earthquake, but hits back with a big submission. Using our speed, we land one more Earthquake for the KO. Gyarados means we have to switch into Opal, who sponges a Blizzard, getting the KO with a Thunderbolt. Arcanine doesn't like Thunderbolt too much as it launches a Hyper Beam, dealing a fair amount of damage. One more hit though, downs the dog. Executor is extremely allergic to bugs, so a Pin Missile easily gets the KO. I don't fancy a Mirror Match, so we're going to switch into Snoopy. A few headbutts take us down to the yellow as we finally land a Sleep Powder. Now that it's asleep, we can safely switch into Matcha for the Yoko. So now that we've become champion, we need to go through the post game. But again, what does the post game involve? Well, since you did ask nicely and you have hit that subscribe button, I'm assuming, I will tell you what the post game involves. So if you don't want to know, this is your warning. Right, so now that we're onto the post game, we need to rematch every single gym leader, take on the Elite Four again, and completely fill our Pokedex. I even thought this weird man in Cerulean Cave claiming to be Smith. I do, however, have a bit of sad news before we continue. I'm just gonna let the footage do the talking. Nice, decent damage. <gasps> no! No, 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 no! It is the first death of the run and it's so close to the end so it did sting a bit because now that we've done everything else in the game all we've got to do is take on one last fight. Oak leads with Tauros. Poetic. Chanda puts up a reflect and takes a hyper beam fairly well. Knowing it has to recharge, we hit it with a Psychic and then use Recover as an Earthquake does a small amount. Another Psychic then takes down the ball. At this point, I let out an audible sigh, not because he sent out a Legendary, but because this Legendary in particular indicates that he'll have at least two more. We hit a Psychic that deals just under half and we do get the special drop, which is huge. Chanda puts in the work and survives a Thunder. We pop a Recover as we are paralyzed. Sky Attack, which is a single turn move in this rendition of the game, does low damage as Psychic finishes off Zapdos. Articuno comes out and there's not many Pokemon that want to switch into an attack from this thing. Articuno sets up a Reflect as we heal again. Sky Attack then crits and Oko's Chunder, that is not good. Opal outspeeds and does great damage. Blizzard does about half as we take out the second bird. We know who to expect, Tobin comes in as the Moltres charges up a solar beam. Seeing this, we pivot into Klungo who eats them all day long. Slash, even with a crit, doesn't do as much as I'd like as Sky Attack does troubling damage. So we switch back into Tobin as Moltres charges up another solar beam. Knowing that we just need to deal some damage to this thing, we opt to Surf, which takes it down to the red, but Solar Beam does take down Tobin. Opal comes out since I know that they can outspeed and they do get the KO. Two more Pokemon to go and no, not again. We switch into Snoopy who takes a Hyper Beam very well. We put it to sleep and then proceed to sap its health until it falls and we're back at full HP. Oak's final Pokemon is a level 81 Nidoking. At this point, if we miss a Sleep Powder, we are done. Sludge does huge damage, and the only thing that we can bank on now is hitting that Sleep Powder. Land it, we do. So we switch into Klungo, we unleash a Fire Blast, bringing it down to the yellow, and then we Earthquake it for the win. So now that we've completed everything this game has to offer, is it any good? And I need to say yes. 
I feel like what this game does is bridges the gap between Fire Red Live Green and the original Red and Blue games. As someone who grew up with them original games, I don't find the remakes as nostalgic, but saying that I never went back to the original games because they were clunky broken messes. Now that this exists, I can go back to the old school games, get that nostalgic hit, while still having the quality of life of the remakes, and for that, that's enough of a reason for this game to exist. So to answer the question of is this game any good, I don't see any reason to play the red and blue games now that this exists. But that is all I've got for you, so if you did like this video please do give it a like, if you want to subscribe please do that as well, but that's all I've got for you, so bye!